you know, last week we talked about the fact that God has provided for every believer a life of abundance, a life that is full, a life of freedom, a a life of fruitfulness, a a life of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and hope, and the list goes on and on. And God didn't just measure those out to us, by the way. According to the scripture, he's given those to us in abundance. But what we learned last week is this. There's a thief of that abundance for the life of the believer. Can't steal away the life of the believer, can steal away the abundance. And that's sin. We looked at not just the big sins that make us go, oh, wow, I can't believe I did that or you did that. But talking about the small sins, we all go, ah, that's not that bad. We learn to tolerate them in our life. At the same time as we tolerate them, that poison is working in us, stealing away the abundance of the life that God has for us. Well, this is what I want to do this morning. We're working our way through Romans. And I want to not just lay out a biblical outline for you of Romans uh, 5, 12 through 8, 17, which is the section that deals with the believer's struggle with sin. That's the series we're in now. Us as believers, our struggle with sin. But today I want to talk to you as if you and I were believers and we walked into Paul's office and said, Paul, I'm struggling with this sin. Do you have any advice for me? And I'm going to share with you just the heart of what Paul would share with you this morning. We're not going to go look at Bible verses. We're not going to go back and try to justify everything I say with the Bible. I trust that you'll come back in weeks to come because this is just an overview to introduce you to what we'll be looking at week by week as we go from here and see how God's Word teaches us about this. So today, just sit back. You know, you can go back to the uh, internet, download the notes later. encourage you, you may want to do that because we're going to cover a lot of territory. But you're going to hear the heart of what Paul would share to you and I. If I said, Paul, I'm struggling, what advice do you have for me? He would start with some theology. He would say this, you know what? God created you in his image. And he created you with a life that was meant to be full and free and fruitful to reign for him and to enjoy all the good gifts that he's given to us. But when Adam sinned, at that time when he disobeyed God's command, sin entered into the world. And his action represented and impacted every person that's been born from that time. I gotta stop and think. Adam really was our father. Stop and think, you take your grandfather way up here, if he was removed when he was a child before he had children, we wouldn't be here today, would you? You see, and we go back to Adam, he's the father of all mankind, and if he was taken off the scene before him and Eve had children, there wouldn't be anybody. He really is the father of mankind. And when he sinned, something happened deep within him and in his DNA so that every person that was born after him was impacted by his actions. So Adam represented and impacted all mankind by his sin. He was born after that. And since then, every person that's been born physically has been born into the realm into the dominion, into the jurisdiction, into the rule or the mastery of sin, being under the grips of death, both spiritually and physically, condemned, and at the core of our being, we're born sinners. That's our constitution deep down at the core of who we are. But when Jesus died on the cross, I appreciate those songs say about the cross. I knew it was coming, so my heart was filled. His actions also represented and impacted not all of mankind, according to Romans 5, but all of those who received of his grace. And so there's a group of people that Jesus represented and impacted with all of his actions in his death, burial, and resurrection. And because of his actions, those who received of his grace, every person that's trusted Jesus Christ, they've been born again into a spiritual realm 
where grace and righteousness hold dominion and jurisdiction and rule and mastery in our life. And now we're under the grips, not of death, but under the grips of life and grace. And they're influencing our life where we both have been declared righteous by God when we put our trust in him and he gave us the very righteousness of Jesus, but also because of the cross of Jesus and the resurrection, our very constitution is changed at the core of our being that now at the depths of our being, rather than being sinners, we are righteous as those of the children of God. See, the cross became the dividing line of all the history of mankind as well as the history of each one of us as a believer. Let me explain what I mean by that. For all mankind, it became the division between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant was that external law that was written on stone that kind of showed man what he should do to walk with God, but on the other hand, more so showed us man's sin because of his inability to keep what God wants man to do. So the law, while it showed us what we should do, on the other hand, it showed us how sinful we are and how weak our flesh is to keep the law. But because of the cross, the new covenant, and those of us that are his children, he has an internal law that he has written on our heart. And now what God wants doesn't become a list of shoulds, but it becomes a list of wants because he's put it way down deep with inside of me that at the core of my being, I really want what God wants. He's written the law on our hearts as new creatures in Christ so that the shoulds have become wants. And now the spirit lives within us to give us the ability to obey what God wants us to do. But that's just the division between all of mankind, between the old and the new covenant. Now for you and me as believers, you know what the cross did? It divided something in our life. It divided between who we were and who we are. Who we were in Adam, that was when we were lost before we knew Jesus. The cross becomes a dividing line because before we knew Jesus, we were in Adam. We were under the rule and the mastery of sin. Our core constitution and makeup at the core of our being was that of a sinner, and the Bible calls this, it's known as the old man. But because of the cross, that old man went with Jesus to the cross, and he died at the cross. And now we've been made a new man who is in Christ rather than who is in Adam, And at the core of our being, we are now people that are righteous, free from the rule and the power of sin. That's the theology that Paul would tell us. We need to understand what happened because of sin and what happened because of the cross. Now, up to this point, it's all been theology because, you know, Jesus said this, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so we have this foundation of truth. But now this is what, and Paul would say, let's get practical here. Let's pull out a cup of coffee. If I had a cup of coffee, I'd put it up here now. That's not a hint for anybody to feel a need to go out and get one for me. But uh, we'll pull out a cup of coffee. Now Paul would say to me, you know, we're talking about sin, aren't we? And he'd say this. Do you realize to continue as sin as a believer is inconsistent with who you really are as a new man in Christ? And there's four key words that should shape our response and understanding of who we are as new creatures in Christ. The first word is no. I'll tell you the four words. Know, consider, present, and obey. He's going to say the first thing is you need to know something. And what we need to know is that every believer in Jesus Christ supernaturally has been joined together or grafted together with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. So the reality is is that when Jesus died, you really died, and you're no longer under the realm of sin and death, which you were when you were in Adam. 
and you were simply joined together with his resurrection so that now you have a brand new life. That's what we need to know. I'm no longer under the control and the mastery and the dominion of sin as my master. Now I'm under God's grace and I'm alive to God because of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is the second thing I need to do. Now I know those truths. Again, we'll go into these week by week as we go here. Next thing is you need to consider them to be true of you. Didn't say you just need to consider them to be true. It's a big difference between saying, I believe that's true, and saying that's true of me today, right now. And what Paul would say is, you know what? The fact that you died with Jesus and are dead to the rule of sin in your life, and now you have been raised with Jesus and alive to the life of God, you need to consider that to be true of yourself. You need to start looking at yourself in a whole new light. You need to see yourself as what God has really done because what's true of Jesus is as true of you. And we need to see who we really are at our core of people who have died to the control and the mastery of sin and people that are now alive to God. So we know that fact, those truths. We consider them to be true of us personally. Then the next thing we do is a presentation. But before you do that, he says this. Stop letting sin reign in your body. Stop letting sin reign rule and master your life like you're still in Adam, like the person you used to be. Stop it right now and stop giving the parts of your body, stop giving your eyes and your brain and your hands and your feet and your sexual parts and everything else to sin, to be used by sin to further its purposes, but instead right now draw a line in the history of your life and present yourself one time for all to God, bringing who you are as a new creature in Christ and the parts of your body, your eyes, your hands, your feet, your brain, your sexual parts, and give them to God to be used for his glory. See, that's what we need to do next. You need to know. You need to consider these truths to be true of you. You need to come now and present yourself to Jesus Christ rather than continue to present yourself to sin. And then finally, you need to obey. That's the daily outworking of this presentation. I presented myself now to you, and now daily as I walk through life and encounter the things in front of me, I need to live a lifestyle of obedience to live out this presentation. The reason for that is very simple. Because if I keep on presenting myself to sin, I'm going to find myself going more and more under the control of sin. The very thing I want to get out of, the more I present myself to it, the deeper I'm going to go in the hole of sin. It's going to have more and more control over my life. But if I present myself to God as I walk, what I'm going to find is, is that God is going to be working in my life to make me more and more like Jesus. I'm going to be freer and freer. And I'm going to find that I'm going to have a greater experience of the fullness and the abundance of the life that God designed for me. So we need to know the truth of what Jesus did at the cross and his resurrection and how it impacted you and me. We need to consider it to be true today of you and me. We need to present ourselves to God and stop presenting ourselves to sin and we need to obey him on a daily basis. But what's important here is the order of all that because if we try to obey God without knowing the truth of what he's done and who we are, and without presenting ourselves to him to let him live his life through us, it'll be just a fleshly attempt to try to obey God rather than the spirit of God working in my life and obedience that comes from God. So these are the four truths that are essential to know. But there's a key mistake that believers make at this point when they're struggling with their battle of sin. I'm going to tell you right up front what that is, and then I'm going to break it down for you a little bit. That mistake is this. It's a misplaced trust. It's a misplaced trust, dependence, reliance, or confidence in two areas in particular. 
First of all, there's an external trust that if we can just find the right steps, the right rules, the right how-tos, that's why so many of us turn on Oprah and Dr. Phil so often because, you know, they got all those things. We think if I just find the right answers, somehow then I'm going to kick this problem with sin. That's the first mistrust. The second mistrust is this, that we trust in ourselves, that somehow I, if I just try hard enough, if I just commit a little bit more, if I just choose the right choices, if I just bring willpower to the play, the problem is we got way more want power than we got willpower, and we think if I can just bring my willpower to the table, somehow then I'll kick sin. Guys, this is the key mistake of believers. Even though we know the truths of what happened to us in Christ, somehow at this point, we put our trust in the wrong place, and we're trusting in external steps to follow, or internal effort that comes from me to somehow conquer this sin. Let me tell you why these are a problem. First of all, trusting these external things, getting just the perfect laws, the perfect rules, the practical how-tos to set you free, is we need to realize that this is true of any law. When a person dies, they're no longer under the jurisdiction or the rule or dominion of that law. That's true of any law. Moses' law, any law. And when we died with Jesus, we died to a relationship with the law. We're no longer under its jurisdiction. Whether it be the Mosaic law or any law, we need to realize laws are powerless to deliver us from sin. And actually... Laws often become the very instrument that sin uses to further its purpose. If you're saying, what do you mean by that? Just go down to the children's department and tell one of the kids, don't do that. What do they do? <laughs> you see, the law becomes the very instrument often that sin uses. But be careful. Don't think law is the problem. Law is not the problem. See, law is good and righteous. God's law is good and righteous. The problem is sin. And according to the Bible, we're going to see that sin dwells in our bodies. Sin become, let me say this, our bodies become the base of operation out of which sin works to bring havoc to the whole rest of our lives. You follow me? And now at the core of my being, I'm a new creature in Christ, but I still got a body where sin dwells in it and it makes it its base of operation to try to bring havoc to the rest of my life. But the only exception where sin can't touch is that new man in Christ. That deepest part of my being and my spirit it can affect my soul, it can affect my body, but it can't touch that new man because that new man has already been set free from the dominion of sin in its life. So let me ask you a simple question those of you that are trusting in your steps and finding just the right answers in any law. If the Mosaic law, which was given by God, was perfect and good and righteous, and that could not deliver us, what makes you think any lesser man-made law will? <laughs> I don't care if it comes from the government, from the best psychologist in the world, or the best pastor in the world. Law is not going to deliver us from the power of sin in our life. And trying and trusting to find just the right answers, the right steps, the right rules, at best can only manage sin but never deliver us from it. But there was a second place I told you there's a problem. Not only do we misplace our trust and think we can find just the right answers out here to somehow that will finally set me free, but there's an internal trust that somehow if I just make the right choices, if I just choose right, I bring my willpower, I try everything I can, I grab all the human resources and everything I can to try to make it happen. In fact, you know, the Bible calls that living by the flesh. That's the attempt to take everything I have as a human being and bring it to play and put it to play on this problem it's, that I'm facing in front of myself. The problem is this. The flesh is incapable of beating the flesh. 
they're of equal power. <laughs> you follow me? This is a fight that's going to go on for a long time. And it's not, it's going to take someone greater than the flesh. That's Jesus Christ to set us free from the power. See, our flesh is incapable. The reality is this. I know you feel it. Mark, you shared this this morning. Thank you for your honesty, brother, because you're just like the rest of us and you help us feel better about ourselves. Boy, if our worship leader's that screwed up, I must be okay then, you know? <laughs> Believe me, our pastor's worse, so. Uh, <laughs> but you know, that's the reality. There's a war that's going on inside of us. This new man wants to walk with Jesus and it struggles with sin which resides in my body and influences the rest of my life. And we get to this point in this conflict where we're going, this is wearing me out. I'm frustrated. I'm weary. And you begin to wonder, is there any way out of this sin thing? I tried the rules. I tried trying harder. Nothing seems to work. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death is the cry of our soul. But the good news is this, Jesus. Jesus is the one who's provided a way out. It's that new life of Jesus, deep within us, at the core of our being, that resides in that new man who has set us free from the enslavement and the life-quenching deadness that sin brings to our life. You see, the law cannot deliver us because our flesh, in all of its efforts, were too weak. But what the law could not do, God did by sending Jesus Christ in the flesh at the cross to condemn sin and to break its rule and its reign over our lives. You see, we're no longer considered as people, as believers that are in the flesh. That's someone who's lost. That's somebody who's still in Adam. It's somebody who's still under the reign and the rule of sin. We're no longer that person. Now the Bible says we're in the spirit. Those are people who are now in Jesus Christ who are no longer under the reign of sin, but people who are under the reign of God's grace and God's righteousness and God's life as they master us and work in delivering us from the power of sin. It's Jesus who broke that. Because at the core of our beings, the Bible presents this. The core of my being, I'm righteous. That new constitution, remember I talked about that? The core of our being. Well, let me just say this briefly. Think of us as scripture, and I, we'll go to this sometime later, but the scripture says we basically have three parts, and I can't define them all well. We're people of body, we're people of soul, we're people of spirit. There's three parts to our makeup. The body, I know I like, this is the earth suit that allows our soul, our unique personality, and everything goes on our invisible interior life to operate in this world. But the spirit is that thing that's down at the core. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said that those who believe in me would receive his spirit and out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The innermost part of our being is our spirit and that new person that we are in Jesus Christ and where the spirit lives. And so this is the reality. And let me tell you this before I give you the rest of the reality. You gotta remember, every one of us was born under the rule and the reign of sin. Every one of us was infected with the DNA of our father, Adam, who was, as a result of his sin, everything in him changed. His body, his soul, his spirit, called depravity. Every part of his life was touched by sin and affected by it. Well, when we got saved, our spirit was saved, but as we'll learn later on in Romans 8, we're looking forward to that time when our bodies will yet be redeemed. So we have sin whose base of operation is still in my body trying to work havoc in my life, but at the core of my being, I'm a brand new creature who is righteous. And so down at the core of my being, the Spirit of God lives in my new being, and there's a war and a battle going on between my body, which still, is, is still was not redeemed yet, it's yet to be redeemed, sin still working as a base of operation out of there and trying to work havoc in my life. 
That's what's true of us who are in the Spirit. And this is what God has done. He tells us that the very same Spirit, guys, listen to this. The very same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. We read about that, man. Every, every bit of darkness of hell was working to hold Jesus in the grave. Every curse of mankind that ever was was put upon Jesus at the cross. There was no way Satan wanted him up. He was really dead. He didn't get himself up out of the grave. Someone else had to take him up. It doesn't say Jesus raised himself. It says he was raised. And what, this, what, what we learn in Romans 8 is that the very same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of you and me. And that very same spirit will bring that very same power he used to bring Jesus up from the dead to work in my life to dismantle the works of sin in my life and to bring my body under submission and the desire to walk consistent with who I am in the core of my being so that my entire being, my body, soul, and spirit wants to walk with Jesus. That is glory. That's the truth. That is the truth we're going to learn in Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then he closes with this. You got to remember, he's answering the question. He starts with a question. We're going to look at this next week. So shall I continue in sin that grace might abound? He comes to the end here and says, no, we're not to continue in sin, but we're actually obligated to live by means of the Holy Spirit, a life of dependence, a life of relying our life of confidence in him to do in me and for me what I could never do for myself. Remember we said the problem is misplaced trust? What people are doing as believers, we're trusting and finding the right answers and that's going to deliver me or the right rules or the right steps or we're trusting that somehow if I really try a little bit harder and commit more and really work hard, that somehow that's going to set me free. That's a misplaced dependence. A proper dependence is relying upon the person of God who lives in me right now, the Holy Spirit of God, the same one who raised Jesus from the dead, and I'm relying upon him to exercise his life and his power in me and through me to bring my entire life into submission to Jesus. And Mark, that's why I said last week, not to embarrass you, I love your song, Have Your Way, because it's all about God. Take me from this flesh I love. Here I am presenting myself to you. Take your divine embrace, put it around me. God, transform me. Guys, it isn't about us trying harder. It's about us standing here before God say, here I am, God. Let the Spirit of God have his way in my life. I'm going to trust him to do in me and for me what I can never do for myself. You see, if we live from the flesh, we're going to learn this. If we live trusting and finding the right rules or trusting in what we can do, we're going to find that we're going to get the very same thing even as believers that lost people get. And that's continued enslavement to sin, at best managing it with some tools. But if we live with our dependence in the Holy Spirit of God, God says that same spirit is going to dismantle, break down the control of sin in our life. And he's going to fill us with the very resurrected life of Jesus. So we walk in the power of the spirit and the life of God. So I'm going to close with three what I believe are called truth-filled, grace-shaped words of advice. Every time you face an impulse in your heart, a temptation to do sin, or every time we say, God, you know what, enough, it's time to break out of this stronghold of sin that's been holding my life for years and for some of us generations. These are the three things we as a church, we as a people, we as believers need to begin to practice. 
First of all, we need to believe that what is true of Jesus is true of us. We need to view ourselves in a whole new light. We need to see ourselves now as people that are truly dead to the control and the reign and the rule and the mastery of sin over our lives and people who are truly right now alive to God and all the great glories and riches and blessings that he brings into our life. That's who we really are. And we need to begin to see ourselves as God says is really true of us. The second thing we need to do is this. We need to practice stopping right here, my feet down, say, it's it, enough. I'm done with sin reigning over my life and controlling my life. And I'm done giving my body parts to put at the disposal of sin to be used for sin's purposes. But today, I'm drawing a line in the sand of my life, saying, God, I'm giving my entire life over to you as a new creature who's now alive to God and I'm presenting my body and all of its parts to you to be used for your glory and then finally we need to obey day by day not by trying harder not by trying to find better steps to make it happen but by depending upon the indwelling spirit of Christ to work a miracle in my life so that moment by moment, day by day, I'm walking really not for Christ, but what I like to call the instead of life. It's not the imitation life where I'm trying to imitate what Jesus did. It's not where Jesus becomes my supply boy and I say, Jesus, I will live to you. Give me what I need to live for you, so I'll live for you. But it's what I call the incarnational life where the Spirit of God genuinely, I was gonna say literally, but it's mystical, it's spiritual, forms inside of me the very life of Jesus. And so now Jesus, by his spirit, is living his life through me, a life of obedience and glory to God. You know, I said at the start, Mark has really set up an opportunity for us to respond this morning with words that were not designed so much about just singing words. It's a time for you to interact with God in response to what you heard this morning, what God's saying to you. Mark, take us from here, good brother. God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would take these truths and as the new covenant says, write them on our heart, God. Will they not just be words on the page God, I pray that the realities of these truths would sink deep in us, and God, we would really look at ourselves in a brand new way. Lord, we would honestly give ourselves to you and stop giving ourselves to sin, and Lord, that we would rely upon the Holy Spirit rather than what we can do or what great steps we can find. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.